Do you want a better understanding of franchising? Do you want to learn everything there is to know about franchising business opportunities? Lisa Linkowski, the founder of Milestone Franchising, has 10 years of experience in the franchising industry, training and mentoring franchisees to help them build their business and adapt a realistic approach to business ownership. Today, she will help you feel informed and educated as she introduces a website where you can obtain monthly articles and view a TV show that interviews franchisees and franchisors. Additionally, you can take a free business assessment called Zoracle Business Profile. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate you coming in. Franchising is, I guess, is huge because I know uh, I, I'll just tell you a quick story. Back when my, I was very, very young and my father was involved in the space program. And back in the 60s and 70s, the space program was like, we built, we went to the moon, and then all of a sudden we didn't go to the moon. So guess what happens when you don't go to the moon after going to the moon? You have less jobs, right? So the whole industry was had a contraction, and so he was like researching opportunity just in case he did, you know, he had to go out on his own. It never happened. So we never owned it. In fact, I remember this. He was like, "Oh my gosh, look at this franchise, McDonald's, twenty five thousand dollars. Can you believe they want twenty five thousand dollars for a, a McDonald's franchise?" Now, yeah. you might be able to quote us today, but I'll bet you a dollar it's more it, than 25000 right now. It's, it's a bit more, Kurt. Well, <laughs> so, thank you so much anyway, for Anyway, so franchise, he's been around a long time, but now it's much more organized, right? There weren't companies. He, he was doing all his research on his own, but it's a very different uh, playing field now, which I think is better. So you want to tell us a little bit what you do and why you got involved and how you got involved in all this? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Kurt. And yeah, it's uh, it can still <clears> be the wild, wild west out there. That's why franchise advisors like myself exist, because we have this thing called Google. So everyone can go around and start clicking around and believe that they are an expert in understanding this, this world that encompasses over 4,000 franchise concepts out there. So now you're trying to figure out what which one is right for you? Well, what are you basing that upon? Okay, oh, well, I've got this amount of money. Well, now what are you basing it upon? Um, I like to eat. I, I eat food. So therefore, I'm going to have a food franchise. That's not a good reason to own a food franchise, Kurt. Uh, well, good. I'd rather just, I'd rather go to a food franchise than, than produce to own one. the yeah. food franchise. So Google, I, Google is great because it has a lot of information, but Google does not have a lot of wisdom. Right. So I think, uh, you know, that's app, that's information Wisdom. applied. So I think, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent is people you become very dangerous on Google if you're not careful. Yeah. Like, like, don't like. Well, and I liken it to people <laughs> often the candidates that I have, they're corporate refugees they're, or they're on their way out either by force or on their own. And so, you know, maybe they've had a drink or two, a cocktail or two, and they start tapping around on that Internet. And now it just became that much more volatile and that much more dangerous because now you're just tapping around and people are out there and they're like, oh, yeah, I'll talk to you about this. Yeah, let's let's make it happen. And before you know it, something that could be really good has turned into your worst nightmare. And because you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah, I agree 100 percent, because every business is very, very different as far as like how it operates and how much, you know, time, energy, what you have to know and what you have to implement. Right. So there's like knowledge based industries and then there's ones that are like maybe you're going to go build stuff. I mean, you're going to manufacture something. You're going to you know, serve food. I mean, there's just all kinds of different ways that you can earn a living out there. And they're, they operate very different. A lot of business concepts are exactly the same. When it comes to implementing what you're doing, as far as your day to day, is going to be a very different experience as far as the owner goes. And I think it's important you understand what's it like to own this kind of business versus this kind of business versus this kind of business, right? Right. The execution and how right. it's all laid out. You know, in the franchising world, there is something called a franchise disclosure document, it's an FDD. That's um, that was put into force by the Federal Trade Commission. And everyone always says, you know, less government, less government. But you can see and understand why these things are put into place, because once upon a time when franchising was literally the wild, wild west, anyone could call themselves a franchise and you had no idea what you were expected and you had no idea what you were getting in return. There was no understanding of any of that. The FDD that every franchise business has to have and they have to update it annually gives you all of this 
ingredients, so to speak, of knowledge, of understanding what this, what the expectations are, what this business is, what it is that they're going to provide for you. And I was just having this discussion with someone earlier today that I represent, I represent 500 franchises and one of them, they don't have protected territories. And so they can put someone right in your territory. And I'm like, but that's the whole reason why you have a franchise is because you want a protected area that no one else can come into. But they'll say there's so much business that we know that we could have three people in there. But that gets very confusing for your community, your local community, when you're both in there and you're both working. And you think that, oh, this person that's knocking on your door is the one that you've been working with all this time. And then you come to find out, oh, no, you're a different. You're competing against yourself, basically, as yes. a company, which right. which is not really ideal. That's correct. <laughs> so. That's correct. And then the other piece of this is that you've got this brain trust. The franchise world mm. creates a brain trust where you get to speak to all these amazing individuals that all come from different worlds and all come from different backgrounds and you know and you all get to come together and and work out best practices together. Well now if you've got someone that's literally down the road from you they're now the enemy, right? Right, And you don't want that. You don't want that in a franchise. So I won't show that franchise solely because they do not have that protected territory for my clients. And I think you point out one of the big pluses of this, and this is this, we talk about this a lot in just business in general, is like the mastermind concept where you bring other people together yes. to discuss your issues and your problems and your challenges and things like that. And if you're all in a, you know, I, I, there's two kinds of masterminds in my view. There's one where you have similar businesses or almost identical, and then you have ones where you're divergent, where you're totally different, where you want to make sure you're not missing some ways that you could approach things that maybe another industry is already attacking. But when you have a franchise, you've got that common issue. Like if you, if somebody's running a franchise in California and I'm running one here in New Jersey, we're gonna have a lot of interesting commonalities. We're gonna have some differences, of course, because the markets are different, but we're gonna, as far as processes and things and problem solving and things like, we're gonna have a lot better um, ability to solve problems when they come up or if the economy changes or, or regulations change or things like that change, then we all get together and have a conversation. What's the best approach to take based on A, B, C, right? A hundred percent. And that's one of the greatest things. I was in a franchise myself and it was one of the greatest things was that you're you're not in business by yourself for yourself, right? Like you, you get to sit there and work with other people, but you're still owning your entity. You've still got your business that you're running. But I'm not the smartest person in the room, Kurt, and that I want to sit there and defer to other people and look at them and go, wow, like you know about this and you know about that, and I'm just going to sit quiet and I'm going to listen and absorb. And then if I think that I can add something to that conversation where I'm helping, then yes, I'm going to do that, right? And that's the beauty. You've got 500 owners out there in a franchise. Think about how much, again, brain trust you've got there, right? And you get to help one another. Yeah. No, I think it's amazing. I think it's great. But you also pointed something else out, which I think is really, really critical. I just one, one of mine comes to mind, a couple of them come to mind, but the one that came to mind when you started talking about franchises and like some that are good and some of the bad, like as an able, I remember Boston Market when it came out, it had extremely liberal like financing options. Like almost anybody could get a, a Boston Market franchise. Right. And then they overbuilt and they overwent the market and all of a sudden they were way over leveraged. The market changed and most of them are gone now. Yeah, It's hard to even few. find a Boston Market anymore. That's correct. So you have to be careful. And this is one of the things I think is really important from an underwriting standpoint. Sometimes people come into these, these situations, whether you're just going to a bank or you're going to a franchise or saying, hey, I wanna do business with you. And they're like, well, basically you don't qualify. Right. And sometimes that's a good thing yes. because they know what it takes to get it started. If they just took everybody in, you could have the Boston market issue where like they, they're just going to lend you all the money you need. Well, at some point you have to pay that back. So if your business model is not such that it can cover that debt service as well as all your other operating expenses and other things that are going to happen along the way, you're just going to end up at a point where you just can't do it. Correct. And listen, right? and you'll love this as a wealth advisor, Kurt. One of the things that I make my candidates say out loud is I may not cash flow for a year. And if they did not fall out of their chair and hit their head and have a concussion, then we can continue <laughs> talking. Right. But now the big thing that's out there right now, the big buzzword is passive income, passive income. Everyone wants passive income. And when you have you to bought a CD for that, <laughs> right. When you have to hire <laughs> someone now that's going to manage yeah. your business for right, you. Right, right. Now you just push that cash flowing that much out. 
that much further, right. right? Now you're keeping your job and you get to still have your income coming in, but the business itself is gonna be pushed that much further from allowing you to start seeing that income coming in. Right. And so understanding that, and that person is not gonna be as vested in this business as you are, as the owner, that's not gonna happen. And then furthermore, what happens when that person decides to just quit overnight and they're just gone? And now you've got a corporate business and a corporate responsibility and you're going, uh, can I take a three month sabbatical, please, while I go try right. to run my other business? Like it's a it's a lot. And right. you have to think of all of these things. It's chess. And you have to be a couple steps ahead. And if you're not, something that I look at franchising is something that can be incredibly amazing. And I am a product of having an amazing franchise business. But when it can go wrong, it can go really wrong. Mm -hmm. And it can take you down take you know bankruptcy divorce like the whole thing because it's a it's a really big undertaking it's not something that should be taken lightly for sure no i, I agree and i think people don't realize just how much is involved there's really in my opinion as far as owning a business regardless of what status you're at there's no such thing as a passive business <laughs> you still have to oversee it and you still have to be ready to step in in case something happens we're gonna take a quick break you're listening to master your finances we'll be right back Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. I'm here with Lisa Lenkowski of Milestone Franchising. And we're talking about, uh, really, franchising is, is awesome. I, I think it's an awesome concept because it takes away a lot of the, the years of research it literally takes. If you want to go do something on your own, one, the research of making sure something's going to work, and two, once you start any business, and speaking from experience, every business I've started, frankly, it's not a franchise, but it was it. It's a number of years before you really nail down the industry right. and kind of get it. And there's a lot of time and money and expense that goes into like learning this. I mean, you really, um, you know, you're out there on your own, really. And so having a good franchise or I can see that being an enormous accelerant as far as getting you down the road faster. So a lot of it really just depends on do I want to do this all on my own and take four or five, six years to figure it out? Right. Or do I want somebody else to kind of help me? And this may take me one or two years. And that, and, and then what's the cost? So this is where it gets into like, should I franchise or should I do it my own? Because you have a lot of businesses that are like, I mean, I'm thinking of like, you know, people that pick up your garbage, right? Like one eight hundred get junk or whatever. There's a lot of these. I mean, you think, well, that can't be so hard. I'll go get a truck, and I'm gonna go pick people's garbage up, right? Right. Well, you think, I mean, that's pretty basic, right? But there's a lot more to it. There's a back end. So can you explain to us like why why some of these national franchises always seem to do better? than like people trying to go out on their own and really one off because there's, for there's a every, couple of, for yeah, every reason yeah. that you just stated. So, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> you know, you've got the mom and pops that are out there and it's very fragmented. You know, mm -hmm. it, let's say junk removal. It's, it, it could be very fragmented and they're inundated with calls. They don't have great marketing or any marketing at all. Maybe, you know, they just started kind of creating something and then it, it took off and they started having clients. But then people are calling them and they're not returning the phone call um, because they don't have the bandwidth. They don't have that professionalism. So there's just all of it from, from soup to nuts. When it's a franchise, that's all figured out. You've got a logo, you've got a branding, you've got the colors, you've got the, the name, you've got everything figured out. You have maybe a call center, so your calls are being taken 24 hours a day, you know, by someone that's professional. You know, I've had contractors that, you know, talk about a fragmented industry, contractors where they were writing an estimate for me on a, like literally a napkin. And I'm going, um, okay, but you were the only person that called me back. So I guess right. I need to give you the business. Like, are they bonded? Like, you don't right. even know, do they have insurance? Like so many of those things where when you have something that you've seen around, there's an instant familiarity and an instant, you, you feel more confident that they're going to do the job and they're going to do it well. And you would feel confident to then recommend them to other people. Right. That's really Absolutely. what it all happens. And then they also figure out the marketing piece and they do the your SEO for you. And, you know, you start popping up in the in all the spiders in Google and, you know, they just and it's all the same. And it's all that unique familiarity where if you're in Utah versus New Jersey versus, you know, Florida, it's that same thing. So you go, oh, I know who to call because I had a great experience and I know that they're going to do the same thing for me in this state as well. Right, because they, um, 
as you point out, they they have a they put a structure in place, right. and they've got a, they've got a nice flow, basically the flow of how the business is supposed to go. And I and I, it's interesting. You point out a couple of things. Contractors are famous for not calling people back. Now they, they may be the greatest person at hammering a nail or sawing wood or and putting stuff together, but there there are different skill sets. Correct. They're very different skill That's sets. Correct. So you can be really good um, craftsperson, but not necessarily a good a, business person. But not necessarily a good business yes. person. And I know it's interesting you brought up insurance because I always, before anybody does any work around our house, I always require insurance, obviously, because of what I do. And they look at me, and most of them, I would say, almost everyone looks at me like, nine out of 10, I will say, look at me like I'm, what are you talking about? I go, call your insurance agent. Here's my name. Here's my address. Have them add me as a... (laughs) a lost pay and have them send me over the certificate of insurance before you come out and start ripping my house apart. Right. Because if you die or get hurt, worse, you know, then I don't, I want to know that you're covered and I'm protected. And when you get into the franchise things, what they do that you point out is they have rules and requirements. That's correct. That they have to follow. Otherwise, they're going to lose their franchise. That's correct. So, so, that, you that's, have so you have, to have another layer of protection. Right. They're going to tell you exactly what type of insurance that you have to have, what the limits are. Like they tell you all of that. Right. Everything is written out. And another point that is really important is that in the franchise world, let's go to the contracting space because the home services space is so it's it's a very popular space to be in. They're not expecting a corporate executive to go climb a ladder and start cleaning out gutters or painting or doing whatever it is that you're hiring for that. Right. And to your point that that painter or that HVAC person or whatever it is, they don't necessarily have that business skill. So now you put the two together and now you've got a strong business because you've got the business person and now you've got the person actually doing the work and now you put it together and now you've got that business and it's working well. And and I think another thing that a lot of, if people really think this through, if I'm if I'm the craftsperson, and now you take all that other administrative stuff off my back, right. I'm going to have a lot more time and energy to go out and actually do the projects. So I'll probably be doing a lot more projects than I would have if I had to go home and do the paperwork that I probably would hate to do anyway. It would be like it would you know be like pulling teeth for me. I, I don't really want to do that part of the job. And that's in any business. I mean, you're always talking about how you have to offload those tasks that aren't your that highest you and best like. use. Yep. Well, franchising almost kind of builds that in and says, well, what do you like to do? And what are your skill sets? And then somebody like yourself comes in and says, okay, well, based on what your skill sets are and what you like to do, here are some opportunities where I can kind of plug you into a system where all these other things have already been figured out for you. Is that? 100%. Is that kind of the way it works? 100%. Okay. And same thing in the medical field. Think about dentists. You know, think about anyone that's in the medical field. They don't want to deal with the insurance. They don't want to deal with all that stuff. And again, they're not business people. They went to school for medical purposes, a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. They didn't go to business school, right? And so there's chiropractor franchises. There's medical franchises because of that exact same reason. Yeah, I hear you bringing that up because I've actually talked to some chiropractors that are like, they're struggling to bring in business. They're like, they didn't teach us anything. They taught us how to do, you know, right. adjust, do an adjustment, do an adjustment. But nobody told me how to get somebody in the door. No. Correct. And they're like, well, not what I do. I open my office. Aren't they all supposed to just come in? Right. Oh, that's not the way business works, guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's right. There's a lot of marketing and, and a lot of networking and a lot of getting your word, the word out and, and making sure people, people understand who you are because you're not the only business in town. No. And the people have to understand if I come there, what am I getting? And if somebody already has something lined up that's familiar, that I mean, why do you think, um, I mean, the, I don't know if they're the first franchise, but the first ones I remember is the fast food restaurants. When you would travel, the, uh, you would go around and you knew what you were gonna get if you were three states away from your home state. You go, right. if, if I stop in this restaurant, it's gonna be pretty darn close right. to what I had at the last one. Same layout, same menu, <laughs> same everything. And there's that, there's comfort in that. There's familiarity in that. Right. Right, right. So what are you seeing happening right now, now that we're kind of a little bit out of the pandemic and people, I think, are still th- are, are starting to grow businesses even more now? I know there's a lot of thoughts. Well, let me ask you this question. During the pandemic, I think a lot of people relooked at their lives, so to speak. So, yes. So let's start with that part. So what did you see happen like then? And what are you now seeing happening now that we're a little bit further away from that period of time? So what kind of changes have you seen or what similarities are you seeing between those two episodes that have occurred? So franchising typically, historically, does extremely well in economic upset. Every time there's been any kind of 2000, 
2008, you know, going back, anytime there's been any kind of big economic upset, franchising always does well. And the pandemic was no exception. The SBA saw a record number of business applications um, year after year, breaking every conceivable record. It was inc- it was crazy. And it was a lot of that, I want to take a look at my life and I want to do things differently. And then there was the whole, I don't want to go back into an office. I want to work remote or I don't want to work remote and I want to go into an office, whatever it was. It caused people to question things and think about things differently and what where they were. Um, still seeing a lot of that. It's not as much of an upset as it was, but I'm still seeing it and feeling it. And because companies then started letting go of employees, so I started seeing that um, earlier this year. And so then people are going, okay, now there's layoffs happening and I wanna get out before you know that happens. And I always counsel my candidates, get out, do, Be proactive, don't be reactive like that. You wanna have your job, like you wanna be able to make a sound decision and not be panic stricken. And now it's six months later, you haven't found a job and you're now trying to figure out whether or not owning a business is good and your severance is running out. Now you're panicked, right? Oh, I agree. You don't wanna make a decision then. You wanna make it as you're more comfortable and you're able to think clearer and, and, and not be in that corner pushed in that corner but i still get from time to time and i got it all the time during the height of the pandemic where people were like i always ask you know is there anything i need to know over the next couple of years that could affect your franchise they're like yeah i think i'm gonna move and i'm like well where are you moving to i don't know well i can't really work with you until you know where you're going <laughs> i still right. am getting that from time to time but i was getting that a lot so people seem to be more settled now, okay. but they're still very jaded from the whole corporate experience. And they're just like, I want out, I'm done. You know, I'm burnt out or I'm just done doing whatever this was, or, you know, they're just, they're ready for that next thing. Well, I think that's amazing. I know there's a lot of opportunities out there and we'll take another quick break here. We'll talk about some of those great opportunities that are coming up. Uh, you're listening to Master Finances. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Finances. I'm here with Lisa Lenkowski. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about how more people, like I, you know, like a lot of people, they rethought their work-life balance, et cetera, during the pandemic because they were home uh, with their kids, their family, whatever. And they're like, hey, maybe I want to spend more time at home. Maybe I don't want to go in and commute you know, two hours a day each way and this kind of stuff. So they started rethinking these things. And so some people got into franchising, which is great. And I, I think one of the things that I would say, just just knowing it as a small business owner, there are a lot more tools available to small businesses now that were really exclusively available only to big businesses. Right. So I think when you combine the franchise world where you've got a large scaling operation, when you're talking about the back office aspect of things, I would suspect it makes it a lot easier to step into a new business than it used to be. Um, just, you know, not that it's easy, easy, right? But at least you feel like the the structure is there to kind of um, help you along the way. Where they're gonna and let's talk about the training a little bit because I know when they get into this, like you go to a franchise and it's really kind of a two way thing. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Like, if I'm gonna do a franchise, take me through the screening process. Like, like let's say I'm coming. Uh, I, I, let's say I'm an IT guy as an example, and I got laid off. So my skill is coding and IT, and I know how to like do all this fun backend stuff. But I'm thinking maybe I need to get into some kind of business that connects with my expertise, and maybe I want to be a little bit more on my own and sell my own services. So what kind of process would you kind of walk me through to help me understand, well, maybe what would I do or what would I maybe stay away from? Hmm. Wow, that's a big question, Kurt. <laughs> so as a franchise consultant, what I'm going to do is ask a whole bunch of questions of my candidate. and all talk right, you got, to you got three minutes. Yeah, and talk to them about <laughs> all the different things that are helpful to me because okay. this is really, it's almost like putting together a puzzle. Okay. And I'm putting together the puzzle and every single answer that they give me helps me to put that puzzle more together and more into place. And then I give them something, and you alluded to it when you introduced me, called a Zoracle assessment. And the Zoracle assessment is specific to franchising. And it is a business assessment akin to like a disc assessment that's out there in the caliper, but it's specific to franchising. And it will actually show whether or not someone has a strong sales acumen, what their overall business acumen is in all different areas, 
of finance and marketing and um, HR and leadership and what their values are and their culture. And so all of that put together, then asking um, questions about, of course, their finances. And if someone is sitting on $5 million and they only want to part with 50000 I need to know that because right. I represent concepts that run from 10,000 to $6 million, right. right? So I need to understand what is it that you're looking at and then stay within those guardrails. I'm not gonna go outside of them, just like when you're looking for a house. You wanna stay within what it is that your client wants because that's what they can afford or that's how much money that they wanna spend. So putting all of that together, then um, going through all of that with them start to really formulate now, out of those 500 concepts, okay, now I'm down to you know five, six concepts that I'm gonna introduce them to. Then I go through an overview and I show them a 10,000 foot overview of each concept that I have in mind for them. And I explain to them, I'm like this, don't make your decision just based upon what I'm saying to you today. Like you now wanna go be introduced to this concept so that they can speak to you and they can talk to you and they can really explain what this concept is more in full. And I, I, I caution everyone, I'm like, this is an education. All you're on is on a journey to learn. That's it. And if anyone is pushing you, you know, and, and trying to hard sell you, run for the hills because that should not be happening at all. This is an awarding process. It's like an interview. You're interviewing them. They're interviewing you. I'm interviewing my candidates. My candidates should be interviewing me. Everyone is doing this dance to understand, is this a good fit? Does this make sense? Should they even be in franchising at all? Like you're sitting there and trying to explore all of this and people say, well, I don't wanna waste your time. And I'm like, no, 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 this is my job. This is my right. responsibility. And if I get you to the finish line of, no, I'm not doing this, I just did my job. Like that is my job. It's also important to note that um, the Federal Trade Commission has a rule that my clients don't pay me anything for my services. That if they're awarded a franchise in the end, then I get compensated by the franchise system. Mm -hmm. But I walk many people away from this because I'll come to the point and the realization that this is not meant for them. And then I explain to them all the reasons why. And then Kurt, as you know, we're big networkers. Then I introduce them to other people that can help them figure out what that next step should be in their path. Well, that's awesome. So yeah, so it sounds like a, yeah, it definitely sounds like a, a dance, like a dating, almost like a dating service. With match, a, like a matchmaking, yeah. <laughs> right. So we go around. So once you get you get your your high view, right? So then I've got whatever half a dozen or a dozen different concepts. So then it sounds like what we do is we actually talk to somebody from the franchise from the system. or yep. com company, right? Yep. And assuming that those conversations go well. Yep. Now do we go out and see their facility? I mean, at some point, do we go visit? Do we? Oh, I mean, yeah, I they've mean, do got. We, they have see a little bit more about days. how it all runs, and yeah, tell us a little bit about how that works. Like, so I, yeah, it looks like it might work, but I, until you like in something, do you really like yeah, going to see? I also like colleges, right? You can read about the college all you want on the on the uh, you know, but you got to kind of go and like get a sense of what's this place like, what's the vibe, you know? Right. Is this kind of me or is this not me? Right, and does it fit well? Right, right. does it fit? So. Before the pandemic, Discovery Day is what it's called in franchising. Okay. Everyone had their Discovery Day in person. And that's where you meet the team and maybe you go shadow with another owner and you go out to dinner and you're there with other prospective franchisees. And so you get to hear their backgrounds and why they're looking at the same franchise as you. And then the pandemic happened and it all went to Zoom. And I am pleading with all the franchises out there. I'm like, please put your discovery days back yeah, into I'm an in person. person guy. I'm an in-person Because guy. for something like yeah. this, you're making such a big um, decision. And it is really important not to just be in a little Zoom box. Listen, I love Zoom. I use it every single day. But for something like this, it's really important. And some of them have immediately gone back to in-person and some are still trying to hold on to that virtual aspect. And I, I really want everyone to just go back as much as possible because I think it is important. And, you know, so then you go to this discovery day. Meanwhile, by the way, they've already given you their franchise disclosure document. With consult from me, you are talking to an attorney. You're going to go through that with right. a fine tooth comb so you understand what the heck this document is because it's several hundred pages long and you want to understand it through and through. And then you come to a point that, yeah, I think that this is it. There's also something called validation where you get to talk to other franchisees and you get to ask them 
you know, what this is like and how it works for them. And you can talk to them about their financials. So franchising itself is very process oriented. And so is the process for getting into a franchise and exploring it. It's very, very process. And they all work the same. They all may be, you know, this, this may take a little bit longer or this, but ultimately they all offer the same exact thing, which is very nice. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I agree. So they, they've kind of, they've kind of figured out the template for how to do things, right? So I know, I know, I'll just go to some of the ones I know. I know that, like, let's say you were going to open up, as an example, a fast food restaurant or some kind of brick and mortar place. I mean, they'll not only help you, they'll help you locate a space. They'll help you potentially, you know, potentially, are you going to lease? Are you going to buy? What are you going to do as far to make sure it's an ideal? Like, you don't want to be on the wrong corner. You've heard that, right? Right. Because certain corners, people may not know that, but some corners are hard to get in and out of. You don't want that corner. You want the corner that's easy to get in and out because you will literally not get anywhere near the amount of business just because people can't get in and out of the parking lot. Yeah. Um, Things like that, which most of us like, ah, that's a good spot. But if you can't, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But but, but, but these little things and just like, how do you set up the, the, you know, the office itself and how does it lay out and where is it going to fit and all that kind of stuff Um, and make sure that the business model works, right? So once you've agreed to all that, they're going to help you with all these pieces, which can be very expensive mistakes if you don't know what you're doing. That's right. From soup very to nuts, expensive. like everything, every single thing that you could think of, the franchise or is there to help you all the way, even in helping you select your first um, manager. They're going to help you to figure out who is best and, you know, and, and how and why. And they're going to help you in all that. They're not going to hire the person for you, but they're going to they're going to assist with all of that. So that's the beauty is that getting all of that assistance in all these different directions that are very, very critical for that business getting up and running and, and ensuring that it's going to flourish. Now, typically when somebody gets into a business, I know every business is different, but I'm assuming the franchise or is going to help you with like projections. Like you mentioned, any new business owner does definitely needs to know this, that you're going to, you're the last one to get paid and be ready for not being paid for a while because right. that's just the way it works because it's very unusual. You, know, you hear about these dot-com people and in 30 days, all of a sudden they're having, you know, 20 million subscribers and then, you know, they're rolling in dough. They don't know what to do with all the money. Can't find a bank big enough to hold it all. That's unusual. What's mostly, what usually happens, it's a growth model and you have to get it out and get it moving and then it hits a a critical mass and then it starts to actually make enough money to actually pay you. And a year or two is definitely, you know, a trend line that I would suspect is correct. But when you go through these, I I would assume, you know, your $10,000 business is going to run differently than a $6 million franchise, right? Absolutely. they what have a do? pro forma and they'll so you have lay you. that out. So they have a reasonable right. idea of understanding, hey, based on your market, based on what you're doing, your business, here's here's what we're expecting. So right? the FDD has numbers. They, they're they called items and they have uh, item five through seven, which is all of your expenses. And so now you're going to have a pro forma. You're going to plug in all of your expenses. Then they're going to show you an item 19. And not all franchises are required to have an item 19. But that's where they're showing their financial representation for the system. And it's not it's not owner by owner. So what they'll do is they'll take it by, you know, let's say the top 20%, the the middle 40% and the bottom 20%. And now they'll show mm-hmm. you, you know, here's what your um, top 20% is earning and what their, what their net margin is, right? And what I always tell my clients is look at the middle because not everyone's gonna be at the top and don't be drawn by that. And if you can put out a performa that the numbers look very reasonable and you can eke out a good livelihood with those middle numbers, then you know that you're on the right track, right? right? Not everyone can be up at the top. It's just not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. So you don't know what your market, you don't know the difference, the different conditions are and for why those people got up to the top. So look at that middle. And then when you do validation and talking to the owners and validating what their numbers are and what were the mistakes that they made and you know what would they suggest and did they have to spend more on any of these areas than what was shown in item seven, you know, the item five through seven and why? Oh, I have to spend fifteen hundred dollars more on marketing per month and I had not expected that. Mm. You know, any mm. of that kind of stuff so that you can fill in your performa and put in those worst case scenarios. You know, they'll often show, you know, we're on the East Coast. You cannot compare what a lease is gonna be again in Boise, Idaho compared to the East Coast, you can't do that. So you got to do apples to apples, right? So you want to talk to someone on the coast, either West or East, so that you you start to frame this. And now that gets you to see a better picture and a better vision of what this business is capable of doing. 
Awesome. That's awesome. We're going to take another quick break. You're listening to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. I'm here with Lisa Lenkowski, and we're talking about franchises. And so I like the idea they have this new FDD thing, which was not around when my father was like doing this in the 70s. So that's cool that they actually have to have some kind of disclosure information. I think it's really beneficial. So uh, it's nice to get a sense of like what's going on with some of their you know best franchisees as well as their average, and then maybe the ones that aren't so-and-so good. And, it, and that could be simply, like you said, a location or of course, everybody manages things a little bit differently than other people. But so once um, I start this, I know some of the people I know, uh, especially like the ones I can think of, McDonald's, like they buy one and then they're doing really, really well. And the, and it's almost like they almost have like professional treatment because they, they've, they've done one or maybe it's just that they, they go, well, maybe I should do another one. Right. So what do you think if somebody gets involved in a business, should they do more than one or should they just, yeah, one's good. <laughs> So there's something like 750,000 franchise units out there and 53% are multi-unit owners, meaning that they own more than one location or more than one territory. Okay, so it's a home-based business. You've got one territory, now you expand to the second territory, then you might expand to that third. So over half are multi-unit business owners. The idea behind franchising is scalability. That's the whole idea. So when someone comes to me and they say, I wanna own one Poke Bowl uh, concept or Acea Bowl concept, I said, well, then you're buying yourself a job because Mm. you're not buying a business. That's not what this is meant for. And especially in the food service industry, the margins are so slim, it's very difficult. And so in order to really get to those unit of economics that are really strong, you're talking about now owning 10 of those suckers. You're not talking about one, Mm -hmm. it's 10, right? So your local Dunkin' Donuts operator, they own minimum 10 and many of them own the land that it's on That's so now a lot it's of donuts i know and now it's a real estate play right, <laughs> right so absolutely. you've got the real estate play and yeah. now you can move your your staff around because mm-hmm. they're all within a tight you know space so if you need angela to go over to that location you can because you've got that capability and then you've got you know one regional manager or district manager or whatever and now you're consolidating all those services but they mm-hmm. all run the same so everyone knows what to expect at all of them right so you don't right. have to retrain for that location over there versus over here right it's all the same so the idea of franchising is that scalability now having said that i am so disgusted when a franchise system starts trying to talk to my client about a five pack they're called or a 10 pack right out of the gate i'm always working on a six pack right (laughs) totally different right very different okay different pack but i i caution my clients about that i'm like listen you are going to start with one right and then you want to see how that goes and then you want to see okay it's going well i'm do- i'm doing well and things are going i've got my processes in place and things are going well and i feel confident that i could open up a second now the tricky part of that is that someone could have come along and bought that second territory right by you out from underneath you that's the risk that you're gonna take, right? right? Or you go, okay, then I buy a different franchise. Now in the franchise model, they want you to stay within the same system because what we just talked about, that it's so much easier for you to scale because you already know what it is mm-hmm. and you don't have to relearn now something else, but you can also diversify just like you know you have your clients diversifying right. their portfolio, yep. right? Same thing. So I always tell people, start, but Bef- you know, run before, walk before you can run. Right. You know. Now, if you've got someone who's very savvy and they know what they're doing and they've got the 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 investment in place to handle this out of the four out of the gate, fine, no problem. Then they can look at multiple units because they're going to have the infrastructure in place. But someone who's just leaving corporate America and they're biting their no. fingernails down to the down no. to the nub because they're so terrified. They're not looking at a three pack or a five pack or a 10 pack, right? Like you want to get them in, you want them to do well, and then you want them to continue on. I I agree. That's the old adage as test small, roll out big. Yes. (laughs) Once you've got the process nailed down and you you figured it out yourself, then it's easy. It's actually really easy to to scale. Well, not easy, but it's far easier to scale it up once you've kind of caught the process nailed down. 
And then it's like, okay, just repeat, 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 repeat. Just keep doing what we've been doing. Just do it on a larger scale and, and put the people in place to handle that additional volume. Um, I couldn't agree more. So that's so. What another? So you brought up the fifty three percent. When you're looking at the franchise thing, do, can you find out how many of these owners in their in their current system already have multiple units, or yes. is that they will tell you that? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And so, in fact, that's one so of the. So that's questions. a high number. Then right. that that would be a to me that would be a positive. If if, if right. your average person owns two to three as yes. opposed to one to two, I'm thinking the two to three one might be, oh, they must be doing pretty well if they yes. keep adding different units, right? Absolutely. It's one of my first questions when I when I talk to a franchisor is what, what, what sh- how many uh, units do your operators have up and running? Because that's running. critical, okay. right? Because if they just say they own, that's uh, not the same thing as right. up and running. And so if they say 2.5, I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, that's yeah. really good. I, I like that. Like, that's really good. But there are some concepts that I represent where you scale within your territory. And so when we talk, go back to that home services, where the way that you scale is now putting more vans out, you still have your territory, but that territory could be quite large. And now it could fill three, it could withstand three to five vans running around out there. Oh, I see. So now your scalability is defined by how many vans you have up and running, right? And, And you can get that business going. So that's also interesting as well. Oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. So yeah, so oh yeah, it's like, yeah I'm thinking of several franchises where they yeah they drive out they have cars or vans or yeah. units, right? So those are each added to that, right? right. So and instead of going into different into different territories, uh, you know, living territories, you're just scaling within your ter- your designated area that you signed up for from the very beginning. But there's so much business to be had mm. that you can build within your area. Okay, so the question I think some people are going to ask is, all right, well the franchise. Is is I'm not doing this for free, right? So you're paying the f- fee up front. So generally, how is the franchise or a comp, uh, compensated in a way that's aligned with the franchisee? Because they want to be working together a little bit, right? So, uh, so I, w- I would right. hope there's an alignment where they yeah. we both want to be going in the same direction. So, so this is what these are called royalties. Uh, okay, Kurt, and there you go. You'll have people that. You they know, sound like Kevin. They well, oh, Larry. They, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, okay. Yes, Shark Tank. Yeah, yes, exactly. So you'll have people that they get into their franchise and they figure everything out and they're doing great and they're humming along. And two years later, they have to write that check. Yeah. Not physically, but you know, they see right. it come out of their bank account and they cringe and they get angry and they start complaining and they mm. go, "Ugh, I can't believe I have to pay this amount of money. I could do this myself. Well, no, you didn't. Right. And I tell my candidates this all the time. Someone else created this concept that you then stepped in. You had the privilege of coming in and helping to create your business based upon someone else's, you know, blood, sweat and tears. Right. So do not sit there down the road and go, well, I hate that I have to pay this fee every month because, you know, I, I could do this with my eyes closed because you didn't. And so, yeah, you're going to pay a VIG back to that <laughs> franchisor. We're in Jersey, Kurt, right? Okay. You're right? So you're going to pay that fee right. back to them right. because that's what they get as yeah. part of creating this business model, for sure. And then right. there could be something like a brand fund, and that's a that's all the money's going into a pot. Could be one or two percent of your gross revenues, and that money then it could go toward a marketing campaign okay. for the better of the system. You know, and sometimes they turn it on, sometimes they don't. Um, it all depends. So the average for a royalty is usually 7%. And then okay. an ad fund could be about 1% to 2%. So you're talking about, you know, 9 to 10% of your gross revenue going back to the corporate office. Right, but as you point out, you knock like several years off the growth process of it too. Yes. The, the other thing I've seen sometimes, and maybe, you're gonna, maybe you know about this, maybe you don't, but every once in a while you see, I'll think of like a McDonald's, right? Every once in a while, like, every McDonald's in the country all of a sudden looks different now. Hmm. So you know that that came from a higher on up somewhere because I know the guy that had the McDonald's from the 60s didn't necessarily want to rip down the golden arches and build a brand new building. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But I noticed that that um, that they do periodically. And I think that's part of staying current. Yes. Right. And staying up to date and up to speed. And and, because I know McDonald's has reinvented itself many times. You have to. Right. Otherwise, they'd be probably be gone. That's correct. Yeah, so, no, you have to reinvent So what are your yourself. thoughts about that? And how to fran- I would assume that's like a little bit of a like, the franchise is like, look, we really have to do this. Franchise is like, 
I don't really want to do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you signed a contract and so you don't have a choice. And right. that's some, that's a sticky wicket sometimes right. that happens that you're being told that you've got to renovate. And but okay. again, when you they you are trusting that corporate office to steer the boat of the whole system in the right direction, right? I've seen um, prototypes for Taco Bell designs where one day there's a possibility that they'll have um, locations that have no dine-in. And it's like almost pulling up to like in a bank, the bank drive through okay. and your food's going to come through a chute almost similar and you drive off and there will not be, and it's way less labor, you know, smaller footprint, you know, the whole thing. I've seen prototypes for that. It already. sounds like the old photo mats that I used to yes. go and get my pictures taken. Yeah. And you go and hand you your <laughs> bag one, and the off one you little go. person sitting there like mm-hmm. handing you your pictures. Oh yeah. So yes, that is uh, subway has gone through a lot of issues with their franchisees because they keep reinventing themselves right. and they keep making changes. And sometimes the franchisees are like, you know, I don't, is there I don't a conversation that happens? I know we're running a little, I mean, do they, do they just say, Hey, you have to do this or do they say, Hey, franchisees, what do you think's going on? I mean, do they ever, they don't really do it that way or they do their own research? It's it's from franchise system to franchise system. Because I would think that they'd want, I mean, I would want a little, I want feedback, like what's working and what's not working. I know that like, you know, like a McDonald's will test things. Like let's try this product over here and let's see if it works. You let us know how it works. And then if it works great, we'll roll it out everywhere. Collaboration is critical for a success, a successful system always. Okay. But sometimes when you get private equity involved, and that's a whole nother conversation for another day. Maybe another another show. Yeah. It becomes uh, less and less where they get input from those franchisees. It can be. All right. Any final words of wisdom about franchising before we head out? I think that we have covered a lot for your audience to really, you know, dip their toe into understanding mm-hmm. a little bit more of what can be a murky, a murky space for people or where they just don't understand it. Um, you had mentioned that I host a TV show. It's called Franchise Focus, and it is all about interviewing franchisees from lots of different concepts to hear what a regular everyday person has gone through and why they left their comfort of their corporate, you know, their mm-hmm. corporate life. And then I'm a contributor for something called Franchise Wire, where I write articles about things that I hear about on a regular basis. And then I, I want to address that and, you know, dig into it. I have one about Chick-fil-A because everyone asked me about Chick-fil-A. So I had to write an article. So go to my website if you want to read all about Chick-fil-A. And What's that's th- at milestonefranchising.com. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate it. And don't forget, you can listen to this episode and all our episodes by going to masteryourfinances.us. Uh, have a wonderful day. Master Your Finances on 1077 The Bronx is underwritten by Certified Wealth Management and Investment Princeton. In a society that runs on money, you need to know and understand what's happening with yours. Certified Wealth Management and Investment will guide you on the path to financial well-being and show you how to make your money work for you. Kurt Baker, a certified financial planner professional, will work with you to establish a detailed goal-based plan that will accommodate your financial needs and exceed your financial expectations. Kurt will also help you navigate the often confusing world of retirement, Medicare, insurance, and more. CWMI is a registered investment advisory company focused on personal financial planning, as well as small business planning, estate planning, and several other fee-based and non-fee-based services. For more information on how to reach your financial peace of mind with certified wealth management and investment by phone, it's 609-716-4700 or online at cwmi.us. That's CWMI. Dot U.S.